Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, ladies and gents, to the Absolute Return Podcast. I'm your host, Julian Klamachko. I'm joined by my co-host, Mike Kesslering. And on today's show, we welcome special guests, Matt Crisp, CEO of Benson Hill, and Eric Shire, CEO of Starpeak. Now, Benson Hill is a food technology company unlocking the natural genetic diversity of plants. It recently announced a merger with SPAC, Starpeak 2, that valued the company at $1.35 billion. On the podcast, Matt and Eric discuss where the idea behind Benson Hill came from and the company's mission, how the company harnesses artificial intelligence in its operations, key growth drivers in getting to over $1 billion of forecast revenue, perspectives from both target and sponsor on the due diligence process of a SPAC business combination and more. So with no further ado, here's our discussion with Matt from Benson Hill and Eric from Starpeak on their merger. Okay, well, we are here live with Matt from Benson Hill and Eric from Starpeak to talk about their exciting new merger in the market. A lot of intriguing aspects to the business combination you guys announced, but prior to getting into the weeds on the merger, I wanted to touch on the background on Benson Hill. Specifically, what I find most intriguing about it is you're doing so many advanced things in the food technology space. Like it's seemingly moving in leaps and bounds. The things that you're doing with respect to artificial intelligence, the vast amount of data that you're utilizing, a variety of breathing techniques, really to create innovative food and ingredient products. You got this crop OS aspect to the business as well. So to start off, can you walk us through the company's technology and some examples of the products that you have out in the market that you generate revenue on? Yeah, sure thing. And thanks for having me, Julian and Michael. I'm, I'm uh, Matt Crisp, CEO of Benson Hill. Happy to talk a little bit about the company and the technology. You know, at our core, we are a food technology company, and we're really dedicated to unlocking the the natural genetic diversity that that already exists within plants. And and we like to say that we operate at this convergent space of plant science, data science, and food science, um, and ultimately make. Uh, better food and ingredients by going back to the seed and developing uh, better genetics. So, so tapping into the genetic potential of, of plants um, and focusing on outcomes, uh, attributes of food and ingredients that consumers really want. Um, so I'll give you a specific example. In soybean, uh, which is a, a widely grown crop uh, and it's been bred for, for some time, um, we, the industry rather, has focused on yield and, and we've become great at producing uh, a lot of quantity, but we've actually bred away from a lot of the quality of this, of this uh, you know, really nutrient-rich crop. Um, what Benson Hill is doing with soy is, is we're going back and we're, we're reintroducing and breeding for um, and ultimately commercializing nutrient-rich lines, uh, rich in, in protein, high in protein content, low in anti-nutrient uh, qualities, and uh, and we're producing those in the field, and then and then ultimately uh, delivering those crops uh, in their process form to ingredient companies or CPGs, um, food system innovators like uh, you know Impossible Foods or Kellogg or or Tyson to incorporate in plant based meat alternatives. But because we've produced uh, those crops in the field with such a high level of protein we can actually get rid of some of the really environmentally intensive and very expensive processing steps that are currently used to supply those base protein ingredients to a lot of these alternative uh, plant-based meat protein companies. So um, that's an example of exact, exactly you know, how we're bringing technology and genetics to life and then moving across the, the, the food system value chain to deliver products um, to, frankly, a, a part of the market that's growing at an astronomical pace right now. 
And one common theme that we see in consumer products these days is that that's inclusive of decarbonization and really considering the environment in the production of these products. So I was wondering with respect to some of the initiatives that you have, some of the products that you're creating, whether that be these you know, high protein inputs into plant-based meat alternatives, was this a mission behind the founding of the company? Like, where did the idea behind Benson Hill come from? Uh, well, Benson Hill, I'll, I'll tell you where the name came from first. Uh, Andy Benson and Robin Hill were, were two uh, scientists who, who really never got full credit for, for their achievements. Um, they're both researchers of photosynthesis, which is, uh, you know, the most important series of photochemical and biochemical reactions on Earth responsible for all life. Um, um, but sometimes like a lot of these types of scientists, we take them for granted, we take it for granted. So right. we, 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 founded the company on that name. Um, but the idea is, is really to tap into that natural genetic diversity that's there, but, but to, to come at it with an angle that's different than how big ag seed companies and big ag input companies have looked at it. Um, you know, 99.9% of our caloric intake uh, comes from less than 0.1% of the, the genetic diversity of plants. And so we believe that it's our it's it's one of our biggest untapped resources. And when we founded the company, it was really to realize the 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 um, the possibilities of what new enabling technologies could allow us to unlock. I spent the first part of my career uh, doing venture investing in the life sciences and you know, the principal focus of the that that investment uh, those types of investments is in human healthcare, but the same really exciting enabling technologies that utilize uh, genomics and gene sequencing and uh, cloud computing and AI, you know, have not really been harnessed and deployed to improve our food system the way that it really can. So when you take that enabling technology and that changing context, um, the convergence really of, of exciting enabling tech, and you combine it with that natural genetic diversity of plants. You know, that's where where and why Benson Hill was founded, to, to tap into big opportunities that, frankly, are an enormous white space that we we as an industry haven't yet, yet capitalized on and, and moved ahead. And now, a word from our sponsor, Accelerate, one of Canada's most innovative and fastest growing alternative investment solution providers, with a suite of institutional caliber alternative ETFs for investors seeking diversification and long-term performance. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund, symbol ARB on the TSX, is the world's first SPAC-focused ETF with a diversified portfolio of SPAC and merger arbitrage opportunities in an easy-to-use, low-cost ETF. The Accelerate Arbitrage Fund ETF trades under the symbol ARB on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. And so you provided the example of how how this works within soybeans. Can you provide another example? I, I thought the the example of with with yellow peas is is really interesting and how your concentrate would compare to some of the other options available for plant-based meat uh, products? Yeah, certainly, certainly. So yellow peas are really exciting crop because, um, well, it, it's been in many respects popularized by this alternative plant protein movement. And Beyond Meat a couple of years ago going public uses yellow pea protein as its primary input. The, the source primarily of, of yellow pea today um, is, is PPI or P protein isolate. And in order to get PPI, you've got to go through a very, very water and energy intensive set of processing um, to enrich the protein to a, to a high level. Um, it, it's also, um, you know, it's also a, a product that requires a good deal of, of flavor masking. Um, so if we, we honed in, we are honing and have honed in really on these two areas of opportunity for this crop, which has not, you know, really received any historical genomic innovation um, in contrast to soy. And we said, okay, flavor needs to be addressed. We need to improve flavor. Protein concentration needs to be addressed. How can we use AI-informed breeding and, and tools like CRISPR and gene editing to even further accelerate breeding or even just use it as a research tool to tap into that natural genetic diversity, maintain the integrity of the product, but add... Uh, protein density and decrease off-putting flavor profiles through through an accelerated or rapid breeding program, and 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 we've done that. And what we envision is in the medium term, 
we'll be able to get rid of the need uh, to uh, execute this wet fractionation processing altogether, that we'll be able to use a, a much more sustainable, much more affordable dry fractionation process, which today produces what's called a PPC or a pea protein concentrate. But but that that allows us again to address a couple really critical desires in this in this um, in this movement. One uh, to have higher quality. Uh, less processed, more traceable ingredients, but really, really importantly, as we are also doing in soy right now, it addresses the affordability element, and we're able to produce these ingredients and supply them to a movement that is striving to get to this uh, parity uh, with with meat prices. Um, long term, of course, we think we can do even better than that. But 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 yellow pea is is uh, is another one, top two really. Uh, crops that we're most excited about in this alternative plant-based protein category. One of the consumer trends that I'm following pretty closely is this move to you know plant-based meat products, whether it's Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat, things of that nature. And from a consumer's perspective, not only do they want to be you know more animal friendly, but also reducing water consumption, carbon dioxide output from the value chain within agriculture. I was wondering, how does Benson Hill specifically reduce water consumption and CO2 within your processes? Well, you know, the, the beautiful part about, um, you know, our ESG priorities is that and it combined with our business model is that we can actually go all the way back to the farm. And, and by, 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 you know, our having established close relationships with growers, um, who produce the crop for us, we can start there by measuring impact, uh, carbon and water impacts, as an example, um, but also through processing and, and, and at the product level as well. So specifically, let's use water. Uh, by, by, by using uh, AI-informed breeding, as an example, um, to breed not just for nutrition, but also productivity, uh, we are able to... to uh, enhance the total output per unit input on farm. That's an example. But then this disintermediation of the processing as well, which requires a tremendous amount of water, is a, is a second layer of water savings. Um, and, and so that's, that's, a, that's a, you know, again, water example. Obviously, there's energy savings and, right. and, uh, and CO2 savings that come alongside both of those steps in the value chain as well. Now, conversely, with respect to consumer trends, one thing that, that I do notice, whether it's rational or not, perhaps there's some uh, uninformed consumers or perhaps ignorant, but the, the notion of genetically modified foods, you know, non-GMO is perhaps a theme. Now, you guys utilize a significant amount of artificial intelligence, uh, basically uh, dealing with unlocking plant genetic diversity and seed genetics in terms of really optimizing that. How do you counteract criticism or any perceived risks from a consumer perspective? Oh, sure. So, you know, back to this sort of core belief, I think it's most important is that we actually believe that the natural genetic diversity, which is already there, contains the tools, you know, contains the power for us to unlock. So, so we don't, we don't actually introduce foreign DNA into the plant. Um, None of the programs that I described in, in soy or yellow pea as an example um, are this uh, are GMO um, utilization of technology like AI informed breeding is allowing you to take a a total system view of what's inside the genome and make really smart predictions and, and ultimately go 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 execute a breeding operation. But that breeding operation is conventionally done, so it, it's you know traditional male female crosses. Um, sometimes if you employ gene editing, mm-hmm. this is a, a new biotechnological approach, uh, which further accelerates breeding. But again, it's, it's all the natural genetic diversity that's already there. And so all of the products that we sell today and that are frankly going to market for the next couple of years uh, are all actually non-GMO certified. So oh, they're okay. non-GMO uh, project certified. Absolutely. And, and we think that trend is probably going to continue um, in the human food segment uh, for some time and, 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 you know, in our financial modeling and planning, we, we assume that we'll continue to, uh, to obtain those non-GMO certifications. 
you know, just because it's non-GMO, though, it doesn't mean you can't use technology to predict how to make decisions, right? And so, um, and so that's that's a really powerful part of data science and the gene sequencing and genotyping that I described earlier. It's interesting to make the distinction between using technology but but not being non-GMO. A, a very interesting distinction there. But as well, something else that caught my caught my eye was that in your crop accelerator, you're aiming to increase annual crop cycles by more than two times compared to traditional cropping methods. How are you able to to achieve this? Yeah, it's a great question. So you can use a lot of um, sensor technology, lighting uh, changes to essentially um, accelerate the reproductive cycle of a plant. So the way we would traditionally do this outdoors, of course, is We'd plant, uh, say, some yellow peas in, in Canada or North Dakota. Um, we would harvest them and then we'd ship them to, you know, uh, South America or New Zealand or s- southwestern United States or what have you. We'd grow it there, you know, in the different hemisphere. Then we'd ship it back and we'd go back and forth trying to squeeze two cycles a year. When you go indoors and you can manipulate the environment, um, and, and extend, for instance, the length of the day, you know, what happens is the plant is interested in reproducing. So it'll set seed faster. And by setting seed faster, you're essentially accelerating its ability to make new seed and for enabling you to make new, new crosses and so forth and so on. So, you know, we can, uh, in, in our crop accelerator, which will be online later this year, transfer into it practices that we've already validated which are allowing us to more than double that, 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 those numbers of cycles. And now a word from our sponsor, Accelerate, one of Canada's most innovative and fastest growing alternative investment solution providers with a suite of institutional caliber alternative ETFs for investors seeking diversification and long-term performance. The Accelerate One Choice Alternative Portfolio ETF, symbol 1C, ONEC on the TSX is Canada's first alternatives portfolio solution, providing exposure to six alternative asset classes, 10 alternative strategies in one easy to use, one choice ETF that charges a management fee of just 0.2%. The Accelerate One Choice Alternative Portfolio ETF trades under the symbol 1C ONEC on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Interesting. And, and, as well, so moving, taking a, a step back a little bit and looking at a bit more of the macro picture, obviously you've been very successful with really providing some innovative technology, but something that is, is mentioned with technology companies all, all the time is moving from being that cool technology and, and providing in innovation on that side to moving that into a, a holistic business and you're, you're able to serve serve customers throughout the value chain. Can you describe a little bit of, of how you've been able to be successful in, in building that out from very cool technology to a very successful uh, business? Yeah, certainly. It's a great question. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of businesses with best in class technology. And um, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's, it's not just that, of course, it's the innovation that enables you to get to market and, and provide products to people who care. And um, starting about four years ago, when when Google Ventures, um, which is now our largest shareholder, got involved in the business, you know, we we began to roll out a, a go to market plan that would allow us to integrate into the value chain and essentially meet our, as we like to say sometimes, meet our customers where they are. So, so if you go down the road and you talk to somebody at Nestle or Kellogg, um, and you talk about AI-informed breeding and genomics technology and seed innovation, um, you, know, that you, you can capture a very receptive audience because you're talking about the possibilities that exist by using these technologies. But when it comes to uh, fortifying a relationship with an organization like this, what they'll, they'll often say is, you know, look, <laughs> I buy ingredients. I need you to produce some ingredients that I can buy that have all of these great attributes, these characteristics. And so that's what we embarked on a few years ago is, is an, a, a very deliberate, uh, thoughtfully constructed vertical integration strategy that allows us to develop, in, in essence, a, a two-sided business model, one which works with growers to produce the crop and, and what becomes our inventory, 
But then on the other hand, to work with our customers at the CPG retail, um, uh, quick service restaurants, uh, food service, you know, directly. And, and so actually understand their needs and then be developing the supply chain for them in a manner that 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 meets uh, standards and requirements they have again, not just at the product level, um, but also you know from a transparency, traceability, sustainability standpoint as well. So you have product market fit, revenue growth, and now a big milestone announcing the business combination with SPAC Star Peak Two valued the company at enterprise value one point three five billion, including in this transaction oversubscribed and upsized $225 million pipe financing. So post-closing, I believe that's expected in Q3. You're going to have access to capital. What are some of the growth initiatives you'll be pursuing when you close this merger and you're a newly minted public entity? Well, we're a technology first company and we'll we'll continue to invest uh, aggressively in in CropOS, uh, our technology platform. Um, to develop not just next generations of, of the of the portfolio of food and ingredients that uh, we're commercializing now, but but uh, we've got an exciting pipeline to come. Uh, we'll make some investments in the supply chain to, to uh, not just further accelerate, but also to expand the degree of growth that we can realize, particularly in our ingredients business segment. Um, and then I also like to say, you know, we're we're always. Um, we're always on the hunt for great collaborations and partnerships uh, with folks in the value chain that can, um, you know, allow us to use uh, our technology platform and our capabilities to further expand the business. And so we've got a keen eye towards um, not just organic, but possibly some inorganic growth in the future as well. And one thing that caught my eye going through the investor presentation accompanying the deal announcement is the forecasting forecast revenue compound annual growth rate of 46 percent to 2027 effectively indicating getting to 1 billion plus in revenue over the next handful of years and one common criticism that you often hear from the media is you know, there's a lot of earlier stage businesses that have been around for say less than a decade uh, projecting very high growth rates, and some tend to disappoint. I was wondering from Benson Hill's perspective, you know, what are some of the key opportunities and risks in executing on your growth plan from where you are now to getting where you want to be by, say, 2027? Yeah, sure. Well, and, and, and I can appreciate that perspective. You know, oftentimes, you know, um, there are ambitious growth plans. What, what I would point at at Benson Hill is, you know, we're already an operating business with operating segments and uh, over $100 million of, of, of revenue last year growing at a really nice clip. You know, we have a foundation, um, you know, to achieve these numbers. We're, you know, we've got a, a team very focused on execution, um, but that's where the risk is, frankly. I mean, the, the products that we're on market with and that we're imminently going to market with aren't carrying with them technical risk. Our business is really, uh, you know, it's it, investing in a business like Benson Hill with already achieved revenues with with a, with a with a steep growth curve. Um, frankly, is 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 a is an execution play, and um, and and that's what, that's what we as an organization are really focused around. And and Matt, I would just I would jump in there because that's those are important points because when you look at the forecast, Provale, which is the company's ultra high protein product you know, drives a lot of that forecast and it is about execution. And what I would say from the start peak side is, you know, one of the things about this transaction is that when, when we, you know, first started to connect with Matt and his team, um, we were fortunate to have very good connectivity at the board level. So with Google Ventures, Prelude, that is uh, you know, part of Jim Simon's from Renaissance's family's uh, venture arm, um, we chief that is part of the $60 billion Grosner Estate that invests out of the UK, uh, S2G, uh, Series A Beyond Meat Investor, one of the best food and ag tech VCs in the world. And when we talk to those, um, those, those various investors, uniformly, they said that Benson Hill was one of the most exciting companies in their portfolio. And we did very extensive diligence on the company, which spanned about 45 days. And we hired exceptional advisors and consultants, um, which included Context Networks, that's one of the premier global and agribusiness consulting firms. They had a 10-person team. 
that conducted full scope diligence. Um, we hired Crosslake to do comprehensive software and technology diligence. Kirkland and Ramble did you know full uh, legal corporate environmental review. Um, we had separate calls with customers, partners, and board members validating the opportunity. And so I think from our standpoint, you know, I think this is about execution. And we think we were so impressed with Matt and the team as we got to know them. And I would also add that for potential investors in the company, there are three great videos on the Benson Hill website that uh, in a simple way articulate uh, what the company does. And I think there are each five minutes and they're a uh, you know, very nice way to get up to speed on the business. Yeah, thanks, Eric. It's always nice to get the other side's perspective on the resulting entity and what you found attractive, some of the aspects of your due diligence process. And I'd like to pose the same question to Matt from Benson Hill's perspective. What stood out to you regarding Starpeak as the ideal SPAC sponsor for your growing public transaction? And what was the process behind that in terms of due diligence and things of that nature? Yeah, no, great question. Well, it's funny. Due diligence was actually one of the, you know, one of the areas that we wanted to ensure we had a, a very capable potential partner um, suited up and ready to go in that regard. Um, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about how excited we are uh, around crop OS and our capabilities, but um, you know, to have a, a, a very sophisticated group come in, engage very top tier talent to do extremely deep diligence on the company. We felt would, would be a nice validation, um, and and Star Peak certainly turned over all the rocks and, and did did a very 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 extensive uh, diligence take on on what was going on. Um, the other key, I'd say, criterion for for uh, you know our board's consideration and and a and a prospective um, partner and a SPAC was you know having an organization that was really aligned in terms of the values, the target area, and in the case of of Star Peak and Benson Hill. You know, sustainability was obviously the anchor point for that. Uh, We also considered, you know, uh, is this an organization that's actually done this before? Um, It's obviously not a transaction Benson Hills embarked on and having a partner who had uh, would be would be meaningful, value, valuable, Um, providing a a fair valuation, you know, and recognizing the achievements that Benson Hill, um, you know, has 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 uh, banked over the course of the last few months. Uh, of course, I mean, very obviously having a capital uh, in trust to, to help deliver the growth, the growth curve that, that we envision. So these are, I don't know, four or five you know, core, sort of core criteria, key criteria. And, and we were really impressed with the Star Peak group. They aligned on all of those elements, had done this before, um, did provide a, a fair valuation, um, not the highest. But, you know, we were really interested in the whole package of you know, um, alignment, partner alignment. And, and we feel like we got that. And we're very happy about, very happy about the, the, how the last few months have gone. And as you embark on this going public journey, you'll be unleashed into the public markets where there's, as you know, uh, a number of competitors. The agritech business is it's really he- heating up. We're seeing uh, a number of new companies or fairly new companies going public and competing for investor attention. So, Ultimately, what is the the quick investment thesis for Benson Hill compared to others, and why should investors pay attention to your stock over competitors? Mm-hmm. Well, I'll answer. Yeah. And I'll, I'll point to Eric and, and ask Eric to chime in on this too, because you know, we're obviously bringing a perspective coming into the public market for the first time. Eric and his team have uh, decades of experience already. Um, so, but I'll but I'll throw in my answer first, real quick. I mean, what Benson Hill is a, is a is a bet on food system movements, right? I mean, we're not a bet on a brand. We're not a, a bet on a facility, on a crop, on a product. We're a bet that we like to call as the picks and shovels for major food system trends. The first of which um, is plant-based protein. It's extremely exciting. And it at Benson Hill will be across multiple crops, uh, a, a diverse array of, of, of growing and production locations in dozens or even hundreds of brands. And so a bet on Benson Hill is a diversified bet, uh, you know, in the near term on the plant-based protein movement. Um, but over time, I'd argue is, is, is a great bet on you know, food system trends because there's going to be more beyond even plant-based protein. Yeah. And I would add, I would add from our standpoint, you know, we think about category defining companies. 
And I think from our perspective, Benson Hill is a category defining company. It has true scarcity value. Um, and it has a fluid operating system, as Matt pointed out, that really positions the company to be the picks and shovels of the plant-based revolution. Um, it's one of the few ways you can invest in the protein side of the plant-based movement from the ingredient side. And when we you know, think about the business, there's really, there's, there's five main reasons that we think it's a really attractive opportunity. One is it's a huge and growing market. I think an investor has to believe in that to invest in the company. They have great technology and a great management team. It's going to have a, you know, $600 million of cash in the balance sheet um, you know, post-closing, and they can use that to attack the market. It's at a really attractive inflection point now where it's got a, a, a real revenue base. And, you know, finally, it's right down the middle of the fairway for a broad set of global ESG-focused investors where there are environmental benefits through lower emissions and more efficient uh, use of land and water. And there are benefits to society around human health, hunger, and economic development. We think all those things are really attractive to a broad set of global investors, not just U.S. investors. So, you know, we're really excited about the company and, you know, we think incredibly highly, as I probably said three times on this call, this management team. For sure. And so to summarize the investment thesis for Benson Hill stock, large total addressable market, they got the technology management that's executing, strong balance sheet, inflection point with respect to timing and revenue is scaling. And you got this added ESG benefit as well, and as you indicated right now, uh, in terms of the opportunity for investors and, and the risk, of course, is just executing on the business plan. And we're definitely looking forward to watching how you guys perform in the public markets. Really exciting deal. Thank you, Matt and Eric, for coming on the Absolute Return podcast today, explaining your story, the background behind Benson Hill, and some of the cool and interesting technologies you guys have going on there, and specifically the potential growth in the future as well. So currently Star Peak 2 trading under the symbol STPC. When the deal closes, expected in Q3, should trade on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol BHIL. Did I miss anything, guys? No, this is great. And thank you guys so much for having us. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Matt and Eric. A real pleasure. And we wish you the best of luck. Thanks, Julian. Thanks, Michael. We appreciate it. All right. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.